Trojans Talk Research is a monthly spotlight on the research interests of Choi's faculty presented by Choi University's Office of Sponsored Programs. This month, Dr. Grant Mauser will discuss his research on blood flow restricted exercise from the lab to the clinic. I'm Dr. Carter. I'm the new Dean of the College of Health and Human Services. It's, it's quite an honor to uh, step in and place the Dr. Schluter to introduce Dr. Mauser. Um, he probably doesn't need an introduction to most of you, uh, but I'm going to do my best to uh, do it justice. Um, obviously, he is a leading expert in the field of blood flow restriction. Uh, that's both nationally and internationally. He has a senior leadership role in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Promotion. Uh, he's a very valued researcher here at Troy University and in many ways has exceeded expectations in that regard. And also he is a great teacher. I've heard a lot about his teaching ability and quite frankly when you're a great researcher and a great teacher you usually don't see those combinations that often so he's to be applauded in that regard and so I won't say too much more about him because you know we don't want his head to swell too much <laughs> but uh, without further ado uh, Dr. Miles. Thank you all for coming uh, this is the, the title of the talk obviously blood flow restriction from the lab to the clinic I wanted to describe kind of the background of blood flow restriction where it started, where it's come to now, and my small part in that. Uh, my background, I did my undergraduate and my master's degree at the University of Oklahoma, my undergraduate in health and exercise science, my graduate or my master's degree in exercise physiology. And when I started my master's degree, I joined Dr. Mike Bemben's lab. Dr. Mike Bemben, highly connected to blood flow restriction and skeletal muscle research in general. He and his wife just retired to Albuquerque, New Mexico after 30 some odd years at the University of Oklahoma. After I left the University of Oklahoma, I went and did my PhD at the University of Mississippi, where my PhD mentors were Dr. Jeremy Linicky. I was working out of the Kevzer Ehrman uh, Applied Physiology Laboratory there. Dr. Linicky was in charge of that. And I also got to work with a man named Dr. Takashi Abe. If you all ever learned anything about how skeletal muscle hypertrophies and how the pination angle of the fascicles within the skeletal muscle changes due to that hypertrophy, that was all Dr. Takashi Abe. He's been doing this since the 80s. Heavy use of ultrasound measurements in measuring skeletal muscle and blood flow. So this is my background. This is where I come from. My research interests are several because of these labs that I've come from. First and foremost, I'm interested in skeletal muscle plasticity. So how skeletal muscle adapts to resistance exercise, how it de-adapts or how it atrophies following prolonged bed rest, space flight, things like that. I'm also interested in vascular structure and function and adaptation. So when we train, when we train aerobically, we get certain vascular adaptations when we train with resistance exercise, when we train for hypertrophy or strength, we get different vascular adaptations. I am interested in these. And that led nicely into my interest in blood flow restricted exercise. And this is the major topic of this, so let's get into it. What is blood flow restriction? If you pick up almost any research paper about blood flow restriction, it will begin something like blood flow restriction is the application of mechanical compression to the proximal most portion of a limb with the goal of occluding venous outflow and restricting arterial inflow. That's kind of our boilerplate definition of it. We typically combine it with resistance or aerobic exercise of some type. Now how we do it, you can use wrist wraps or knee wraps for power lifting. This is called the practical blood flow restriction. These are elastic wraps Power lifters will use them, they'll wrap them around their knees so they can lift heavier in the squat. It helps them get out of the hole in the squat. You can wrap them around the top of your arms, you can wrap them around the top of your legs, and you can simulate how we do blood flow restriction. When we do it in the lab, when we study it, we'll use pneumatic cuffs of some kind. This is a Hokanson cuff. It's like a traditional blood pressure cuff. It's made of inelastic nylon, it has an air bladder in it and we'll connect it to an inflatable pump 
that's connected to an air reservoir and we can inflate it very rapidly and we can deflate it very rapidly. This is how we do it in the research lab. These, where you have what appear to be small blood pressure measuring devices, these have come along really in the past five years. These are for personal use. So these, you would buy these if you wanted to take blood flow restriction to the local gym. And you'll put the cuff on your arm or your leg, you'll push the button, it'll inflate it, it'll find the pressure that cuts off your blood flow, and then it will dial that back. And then while it's inflated, you perform your exercises. So how we do it, how we are supposed to do it, and this is really the gold standard of how we do blood flow restriction. We will start out with some type of pressure inflation device to hook to these cuffs. We'll put the cuff that we are going to use for the blood flow restriction either at the top of your arm or at the top of your leg. Those are the only places where you can do blood flow restriction. And then we will use what's called a vascular Doppler, which is a little ultrasound sound device. Put some ultrasound gel on it and we'll measure either your radial artery pulse or we'll measure your posterior tibial artery pulse in your ankle depending on whether we're doing upper or lower body blood flow restriction. This device converts that ultrasound wave to an audible sound so you can actually hear the blood flowing through that artery. And then we'll slowly inflate the cuff until that pulse goes away. That pressure at which the pulse disappears is termed either the arterial occlusion pressure, if you're reading specifically blood flow restricted information, or it's called limb occlusion pressure if you are dealing with the rehab side of things. Physical therapists tend to call it the limb occlusion pressure. Now how we perform blood flow restriction, once we have that pressure that will cut off your blood flow, we want to use some percentage of that. And that percentage is typically 40 to 80% of the occlusion pressure. So if we measured your occlusion pressure in your arm as 100 millimeters of mercury, we would dial that pressure back to somewhere between 40 and 80 millimeters of mercury. You would still have arterial inflow. And briefly, we would halt venous outflow from that limb. And then you can perform resistance exercise. The traditional prescription for blood flow restricted exercise is 30% of the 1RM at somewhere between 40 and 80% of the occlusion pressure in that limb. And you do four sets of exercises. Your first set is typically 30 repetitions and then the following three sets are 15 repetitions. There is some data that I will show you later on that those are called goal repetitions for a reason. Restricting blood flow and lifting weights even at such a low level, very few people will make all of those repetitions. So we call them goal repetitions. But you don't lift heavy. The goal of blood flow restriction is to fatigue the muscle at a lower weight than would normally be required. So instead of lifting at 70 or 80% of your one repetition maximum, your maximum strength, we have you lift at 30%. The reasoning behind this is several fold. Some people don't want to lift heavy. Some people don't feel like lifting heavy some days. But if they go in and do blood flow restriction, now they can dial the weight down just lift more and derive the same benefits. More recently, and we'll talk about this more later, but more recently, blood flow restriction has gotten into physical therapy. Specifically started with a company called Delphi. Delphi has made for years tourniquet systems used in surgeries. They've made automated blood pressure cuffs. It was a very small jump for them to modify one of their blood pressure measuring devices and turn it into what they call the PTS, the personal tourniquet system. This is FDA approved. This is generally what you will see in physical therapy clinics. Uh, it is more expensive than other blood flow restriction methods. It varies anywhere between $2,800 and $5,000 for a PTS, but it is considered a clinical device. Even though it's called the PTS, the personal tourniquet system, it's considered a clinical device, which is typically explains why it is so expensive. But I've said a lot of things about lifting weights with your blood flow being restricted. How did we get here? How did this come about? So in 1925, there was an article published in the journal Heart by two researchers named Lewis and Grant. 
And the article itself was called Considerations Upon Reactive Hyperemia in Man, because they didn't name articles as straightforward as they, they do now. They were looking to describe a mechanism by which tissues deprived of a proper blood supply tend to become repossessed of it. They had known about what is called reactive hyperemia. If you briefly cut off blood flow to an artery, to a limb, and cut it off for a little bit of time and then release it and let that blood flow back in, you will get more blood flowing in per minute, per, per time, than you did prior to that. So you increase the amount of blood that is flowing through that artery relative to before you cut it off. We knew this existed from the 1800s and before, but they were specifically looking for the mechanism behind this. There had been a lot of proposals as to how this worked. And this article itself is about 47 pages long. There are somewhere between four and six studies individually within that one article, and they used a lot of hand inflated pressure cuffs to do all of these different experiments. They would do experiments where they had someone hold their arm up and then they slowly wrapped a, a rubber sheath around their limb to push all the venous blood out and then inflated the cuff, took the sheath off, and now they have a practically half empty arm. It has no venous blood in it. All sorts of things. One of the studies that they did was looking to see if once they had sequestered blood inside of a limb, if they could move that blood around sequentially, if they could move it from one side of the limb to the other using a set of sequential pressure cuffs. The big result that they found from that was that they could move blood from one area of a limb to the skin of another area of the limb. They could force blood into the skin of another area. And that caught the attention of these two researchers. Collins and Walensky were two medical physicians. They were in, really, their big thing were vascular diseases in the 1930s. And they read about being able to push this blood to the skin of a limb. And that got them interested. They did a lot of peripheral vascular disease. This was around the time period where we were starting to understand that diabetes could lead to ne tissue necrosis and gangrene if it left untreated in the lower limbs. And so this study, an experience with 124 cases, they created a machine that would automatically inflate and deflate pressure cuffs on their patients at a set time. They were very mechanical in nature. This is still the 1930s. We don't have microcontrollers yet. It was all a mechanical timer set to several pressure pumps that would sequentially inflate these cuffs. What they were trying to do, they were using patients who already had necrotic tissue. So tissue on their foot that was dying, some of them already had gangrene and were in the hospital for that. And they were trying to use Lewis and Grant's method to push that blood near the skin that was damaged, hoping to regrow some capillaries, regrow that tissue. It wasn't wildly successful. 45% of their patients still had to have either a toe or a foot amputated. It worked in some people. Past this, Venous occlusion kind of fell by the wayside. Our medical capabilities got better. We were better able to either save tissue or, you know, debride that necrotic gangrenous tissue. Medical procedures got more advanced. So we stopped looking at this until about the mid-1960s. So at that time, this was 1966, we have a man named Yoshiaki, Yoshiaki Sato from Japan, he was a bodybuilder, he was a power lifter. This is the, what he looks like, this is Dr. Sato, very happy to be doing blood flow restriction. He was at a prayer ceremony, so he was a bodybuilder, he was accustomed to going to the gym and working out a lot and feeling that real fullness in the skeletal muscle. He was at a prayer ceremony where he was kneeling for quite a few hours, and when he stood up he noticed that his calves felt like they did after he had just blasted them at the gym for a long time. And he thought, okay, well, I've been kneeling. It's clear the circulation to my calves was restricted. This feels exactly like it does when I work out really heavy. Maybe I can restrict my own blood flow. And so that's what got his mind thinking. He experimented on himself for the next two decades. He put himself in the hospital twice 
because he was cutting off his own blood flow and sometimes he did it for too long. When he started adding exercise to it, he went too hard and gave himself rhabdo one time. So very much a self-experimenting person. He then met some researchers at University of Tokyo. He designed a machine that would turn on this pressure and turn it off and turn it on and turn it off and you could adjust the pressure in it. And he got them to study it. So the first truly published scientific paper for blood flow restriction was in 1998. It was by a researcher named Shinohara. And it was looking at how blood flow restriction can be applied to lower load exercise. By that point, Sato had already figured out we can't lift heavy with BFR. We have to lift lower loads. And that was the first research study. Since then, we've tried to apply blood flow restriction to just about every type of exercise modality there is out there. We've also tried it by itself. This was the first study that really looked at a possible rehab connection with blood flow restriction. This was done by Takarada and colleagues in 2000. They recruited a bunch of men who were about to go in for ACL reconstruction. And if you know anything about ACL reconstruction, the quadricep of the limb that has the knee that, that gets the new ACL, gets the ACL repair, that quadricep atrophies a lot within the two weeks following the surgery. Immediately after surgery, you barely have voluntary control over that quadricep. And so they were looking to see if just applying blood flow restriction repeatedly, meaning they brought them in twice a day and they would lie down on a table, they'd put the cuffs on their leg, and they would inflate it for five minutes, deflate it for three minutes, and they would do that cycle five times, morning and afternoon. What they found, this is a decrease in cross-sectional area. Everyone's going to atrophy following ACL reconstruction. This is a decrease in the cross-sectional area. The experimental group, the one that got the blood flow restriction, it atrophied less than the group that didn't get blood flow restriction. They both got standards of care, post-operative standards of care. This group just had blood flow restriction added. So this was really kind of the first hint that maybe we should look at rehab for blood flow restriction and not just resistance exercise. And I'll come back to this because there's a caveat with that study. We also did it with walking. This is a study done by Dr. Abe in 2010. They took an older population and they had them do a treadmill study. They simply got on a treadmill and walked at a moderate pace, something like two and a half to three miles per hour. One group simply walked. One group walked while they had the blood flow restriction cuffs on. And they found at the end of it two measures of physical function, so a change in a timed up and go test and a change in a uh, chair to stand, sit to stand test. Uh, the performance in these increased in the people who had done the blood flow restricted walking versus regular walking. The reason this was significant, and especially for the time period, especially for 2009 to 2010 when this study was going, was that at this time no exercise group, no health group had anything good to say about just walking for muscle function. Walking is good, but just walking is not really meant to cause any type of increase in muscular function in people who were already walking. So this was kind of an interesting finding. Where we see it most often applied is to resistance exercise. And I picked this one out of a lot of them. There are a lot of blood flow restriction studies that show specifically if you use blood flow restriction, your muscle will hypertrophy. It's as simple as that. This study was looking at power lifters. Power lifters who had been power lifting for a very long time, meaning it was very unlikely that they were going to hypertrophy that much more. And they had some of them do their regular training. The control group did their regular power lifting training. And they had an intervention group that did blood flow restricted training, 30% of their 1RM, all of the same exercises. But when it came to either the arms or the legs, they would be wearing the pressure cuffs. And we do see hypertrophy in the blood flow restriction group, in the rectus femoris and in the vastus lateralis. They did muscle biopsies to confirm what they saw. And the interesting finding that came from this study was that it actually caused their type 1 muscle fibers to hypertrophy more. Their type 2 fibers, the ones we would associate with powerlifting and muscle growth, they didn't hypertrophy any. 
It was the type one, the endurance-based fibers, that showed the most hypertrophy and gave them this increase in the cross-sectional area of that skeletal muscle. So this is a background. This is what we have done with blood flow restriction. This is what we know. Where I come into it is right around 2013. So we are using pressure cuffs to restrict blood flow. And that sounds an awful lot like surgical tourniquets. So we turn to the surgical tourniquet literature. There are some physicians named Van Rokel and Thurston. They were both hand and foot surgeons, so really delicate, fine microsurgery people. They were interested in what would create a bloodless field for surgery, but would not leave their patients with neuropathy after the surgery. Prior to this, most hand surgeons, when they put the tourniquet on the arm to create the bloodless field for surgery, they would inflate it to four or 500 millimeters of mercury. That's going to guarantee there is absolutely no blood flowing into that limb. But surgeries that last between two and four hours, you are now crushing those nerves. Those nerves are not meant to be under that pressure. So they were finding a lot of their patients, they would come out of these surgeries, they would heal just fine, but they would have temporary neuropathy. They wouldn't be able to feel certain areas of their hand or their forearm because that pressure cuff had crushed those nerves for that whole length of time. So they were looking at what is the minimum pressure needed to create a bloodless surgical field, the minimum pressure to cut off blood flow. And they measured patients preoperatively. They measured their limb circumferences. They measured their blood pressure while they were asleep. And then they ran a regression equation and they found that limb circumference and systolic blood pressure play the most determinant role in the pressure it takes to cut off your blood flow with an inflatable cuff. Meaning the higher your systolic blood pressure, the greater the pressure it's going to take to cut off that blood flow. But also the larger your limb, the more pressure it's going to take to cut off your blood flow. This fits nicely with that JAMA paper that just came out saying that different sized blood pressure cuffs will measure your blood pressure differently. If you use a cuff that is too large for your arm, it will underestimate your blood pressure. If you use a cuff that's too small for your arm, it will drastically overestimate your blood pressure. This was the first one. This was Van Rokel and Thurston. Graham followed this up with a study looking at different cuff widths. So if we know that limb circumference and systolic blood pressure determine the occlusion pressure to create a bloodless field, he wanted to see if different tourniquet sizes, different tourniquet widths, would also have an effect. And they saw this. They found that if you use a wider tourniquet, it takes a lower pressure to cut off blood flow than a really narrow tourniquet. A lot of the surgical tourniquets that they used were about that wide. They required a really high pressure. If we increase that tourniquet size, to be something more like 15 to 20 centimeters, it will take a much lower pressure and it will put less stress and strain on the nerves. We wanted to see if body composition also contributed to occlusion pressure. They looked at systolic blood pressure and limb size. They looked at systolic pressure, limb size, and cuff size. We wanted to see if the body composition underneath the skin also played a role in it. This is a study that Dr. Linicky spearheaded. We started it within about two months of my joining the lab in 2013. And what we did on this one, we brought in 171 people and we measured their blood pressure, we measured their limb circumferences, and then we used an ultrasound, a B-mode ultrasound machine, to measure their body composition, meaning the thickness of the muscle versus the thickness of the subcutaneous fat underneath that cuff. And we ran that through a regression equation. Same as these, just a predictive regression equation. And what we found out is that systolic blood pressure and limb circumference do play the same part. We found the exact same thing that Van Rokel and uh, Graham found. And we also found that body composition plays no impact. It doesn't matter how much subcutaneous fat you have versus how much skeletal muscle you have it is strictly related to the limb circumference. It doesn't matter what's underneath that circumference. About the time this study was wrapping up, it came time for me to start looking at what I was going to do for a thesis study. I needed to wrap up my master's degree. 
And one thing that I had noticed, we keep calling this blood flow restriction, blood flow restriction, we're only measuring skeletal muscle. There had only been two papers that actually looked at how much are we restricting blood flow. Both of them by the same researcher, uh, Professor Aida out of Japan, in 2005 measured blood flow in the brachial artery under several different levels of occlusion pressure. These are absolute, so 100 millimeters of mercury, 200 and 300 millimeters of mercury. And we see this nice linear decrease. The more pressure we apply to the limb, the less blood flow there is. He repeated the same study two years later, this time in the femoral artery. The more pressure we apply, the lower the blood flow. But what got me thinking on this study, this one is just the averages. This one shows all of the individual results. All of these open circles are the individuals in that study. And if you look really closely, what you notice, some people are occluding at 200. Some people by 250 still haven't occluded. Some people by 300 still haven't occluded. And this was right about the time with blood flow restriction where we started recommending applying the pressure relative to the individual. You know, at the beginning I told you, we'll measure your occlusion pressure, and then we'll apply a percentage of that. We didn't always do that. That is the gold standard. But we didn't always do that. It used to be arbitrary, put 100 millimeters of mercury on them, put 200. The bigger their limb, maybe add some more. So I took this and ran with it, and my thesis study, I lucked out right as I had started my master's degree. A professor by the name of Carl Audie had joined the faculty at University of Oklahoma. He studied under Dr. Barstow at K-State. Dr. Barstow, really, really good cardiovascular physiologist, does a lot with vasculature. Dr. Audie brought his experience with running uh, pulse wave Doppler blood flow measuring ultrasound with him. So he taught me how to measure blood flow using an ultrasound machine. So here we have a cross section. This is a brachial artery. Here we have the gate where we're measuring the actual movement of the blood. This is a graph of blood velocity over time. And if you take the velocity over time integral of this, you can get volumetric flow of the vessel if you know how wide the vessel is. So spent several hundred hours learning this technique because he wouldn't let me use the machine until he was happy that I was good with this measurement, as it should have been. And so then I did a study looking at how much blood flow we actually restrict when we apply different relative levels of blood flow restriction. Recruited about 45 people, had them sit in a chair, we put a five centimeter cuff at the top of their arm, measured their occlusion pressure after they had been resting for a while, and then sequentially we applied 10 to 90 percent of their occlusion pressure to their arm. Every 10 percent we would measure their blood flow. And this is what we came up with. This is not linear at all. At 10 percent we see a rapid decrease from resting. So this is absolute blood flow across all of these percentages. This is resting, this is 90 percent. See a rapid decrease at 10 percent but from 40 to 80%, we don't see a change in blood flow. It jumps around a little bit, but between 40 and 80% of the blood flow restriction pressure, of the occlusion pressure, blood flow at rest remains remarkably consistent. And then once you hit 90, it starts to dive by the time you get to 100. If that reading was accurate on the occlusion pressure, you would expect to see no blood flow at all. This was my thesis, it, it, it went well, uh, it got me my master's degree obviously. And so then I went to the University of Mississippi and we expanded this. We wanted to see if this type of exercise or if this type of measurement would also occur across different cuff sizes. So this was done only with a five centimeter cuff. This was done with a five, a 10 and a 12 centimeter cuff. We picked those cuffs because those are the sizes of cuffs that Hokanson makes. And we found roughly similar findings. At relative percentages of occlusion pressure, blood flow follows roughly that same pattern. We have a nice plateau between 40 and 80% of the occlusion pressure. Now, after this, all of this has been at rest, but very, very few blood flow restriction 
interventions are done at rest. They are done during exercise. So at the time we had a postdoc come in to the University of Mississippi. His name is Dr. Laurentino. He's out of the Sao Paulo University. He was interested in this blood flow measurement. I still wanted to do more blood flow measurements. And so we ran a study uh, and we were looking at how different levels of blood flow restriction affected blood flow in the brachial artery across the entire blood flow restricted exercise. So from the time we inflated the cuff through all four sets of exercise, following up until five minutes after we deflated the cuff. We recruited 152 people for this study. 140 of them made it, 12 of them, two of them fainted at the higher blood flow restriction pressures. Uh, some of them just could not finish the exercises, got very flushed, very uncomfortable. Uh, of the 140 who finished, three of them did not have good data. We weren't able to get good ultrasound data on them. So we ended up with 137 people across three groups. We had the no BFR group that lifted 30% to the regular protocol. We had a 40 BFR group and we had an 80 BFR group. We further subdivided it into men and women to see if there was a different response to them. Now, when I told you all those were goal repetitions, this is the repetitions over time for all of these groups. So the first really tall bar, that's your, your first set, 30 repetitions. Everything after that is supposed to be 15 repetitions. And we see a drop off as the pressures increase. Once we get up to these higher pressures, no one is completing all of the goal repetitions. They are in effect exercising to muscular failure, momentary muscular failure. For the men, this was our blood flow response. So we are at rest here. When we inflate the cuff, obviously the control group did not get a cuff, so their blood flow remained constant. Both the 40 and 80% BFR groups, their blood flow decreased. But once we start exercise, the free flow condition with no blood flow restriction, they were able to maximally perfuse that muscle. They exercised at that 30%, they were able to maximally perfuse the muscle. This is unrestricted blood flow. 40% of blood flow restriction pressure decreases blood flow by about that much. So even though at rest, the difference between 40 and 80 was non-existent, once you start exercising, the difference between 40 and 80 becomes very, very apparent. 80% of occlusion pressure is very uncomfortable the first two or three times you do it. It is an experience to have. It is unlike most exercise experiences. We see an almost similar response with the women. Same thing, free flow condition, blood flow continues to increase. 40% is less than free flow. 80% is much less than both other conditions. In the women though, the hyperemic response following cuff deflation was much more pronounced than in the men. The 80% BFR group overshot both other groups in their hyperemic response. We still don't have a good answer for that. A little while later, we redid that same study, but now we were looking at whether or not the load lifted affected this type of activity. So the previous example was done with 30% of one RM. We did it with 15% of one RM. We literally had some people in the lab lifting those little pink dumbbells that are two pounds with BFR. We had some people who just had to grab a little one pound plate. I mean, it was a very, very low load. But we see almost the exact same blood flow response. The dotted line is the original study with the 30%. The, the solid line is the second study, the follow-up with the 15%. Very, very similar blood flow response across the time periods measured. So this kind of brings us up to now. The popularity of blood flow restriction has shocked me with how rapidly it has increased. So this is a Google Trends search of the term blood flow restriction from 2004 to present. I started right about here. And then you get to around 2014, 2015, and it explodes in popularity. And there is a very specific reason for this. There's a very specific reason that a lot more people know about blood flow restriction now. And that's a guy named Johnny Owens. Johnny Owens was a physical therapist working with the Army. He worked down at Brook Army Medical Center. 
which is a beautiful building. And he specifically worked with veterans who had suffered blast trauma. So if you think about what happened in the first 20 years of this century, uh, we had a lot of guys getting blown up by IEDs. And they would come back, and because those IEDs are typically on the ground, they would have a lot of lower limb blast injuries. And he would try to help with their rehab. That could be as much as having to have a prosthetic leg and teaching them how to live with a prosthetic leg. If they had some of their limb left, if they were able to salvage some of the limb, he worked with the team that would either build special orthotics or in some cases kind of mini exoskeletons that were spring assisted to help them regain that function if they had lost a lot of skeletal muscle. While we were doing all of our research, he was keeping up with it and he thought, okay, I've got a guy here who only has 30% of his calf muscle left. Maybe blood flow restriction would help grow some of that muscle back, not replace it, but just hypertrophy the remaining muscle and allow that person to have greater independence. He started looking at blood flow restriction. He started applying it to some of his patients. He saw wonderful results. And I guess he didn't re-up his contract with them because he started something called Owen's Recovery Science. And their tagline is, earn your deflate. He works very closely with Delphi. He gives uh, tutorial lectures, basically licensing lectures or certification lectures. You go in for a weekend and you learn how to apply and how to prescribe blood flow restriction. Make sure we're doing well on time here. Oh, yeah. So with Johnny Owens, doing this Owens recovery science, he first started going out to colleges. And then he started going out to professional sports teams. And he started with the NBA, and he worked his way into Major League Baseball, the NHL, and he slowly got their athletic training and rehab teams to adopt blood flow restriction as an additional rehab modality. And from there, it just kind of blew up. The New York Times, right around the time of the Tokyo Olympics, they had a big write-up on it. They call it a hot fitness trend, but no, it is here to stay. The American Physical Therapy Association now has it listed as an approved intervention for helping people with rehabilitation. And it's become popular enough you can get the bands on Amazon for 1262. This is a very much an example of practical blood flow restriction. These are simple ratchet straps and Velcro straps. I don't recommend them, especially the cheap ratchet straps because if you get that too tight and that ratchet breaks now you have to find someone at the gym who has a knife who can cut that nylon strap off of your arm before you risk damage but it has gotten very 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 popular and it did so very quickly to the point where people weren't applying it correctly and they weren't applying it safely so we got together with Johnny Owens this was when I was still at Mississippi and we wrote this article, it's called The Application of Blood Flow Restriction, Lessons from the Laboratory. We had at this point probably run about 3,000 people through blood flow restriction. We've done it on a lot of people. And we have seen all of the side effects that can happen. And in working with cardiovascular physiologists, we, have, we haven't experimented with this because it would be unethical, but we know the things to look out for when you are doing this in an anything but a healthy population an older population, maybe a population whose exercise presser reflex is not what it used to be, people with high blood pressure, etc. And so the key points of this, how to actually practice blood flow restriction, the pressure absolutely has to be set individual to the person you are doing the blood flow restriction on. You have to use the right cuff. If you are going to put blood flow restriction onto someone, you measure their occlusion pressure with the cuff that you are going to use, and then you apply a percentage of that pressure using that exact same cuff. And then finally, like anything in our field that explodes in popularity, BFR is just an alternate mode of exercise. It's not a replacement for anything. What we saw when it first got very, very popular was a lot of people saying, oh, this is great. This is going to replace the need for high load training, or this is going to replace the need for this, that, or the other. It is an additional modality. I don't think it cures all of the world's ills. I love the topic. I love researching it, but it is just one 
tool in your toolkit as a healthcare specialist, as a rehabilitation specialist. Um, and it needs to be used sparingly and it needs to be used in the right condition. A great example of this, one of my friends who is a physical therapist, he will sometimes use blood flow restriction on his athletes, but as soon as they are able to start lifting heavier weights to get back to their athletic performance, he immediately moves them to those heavier weights. Because we're not just trying to rehab the muscle, we're, we're trying to rehab the ligaments and the tendons, and they need that extra weight in order to adapt again. Now where we go from here, currently, we are doing a study similar to the predictors of arterial occlusion pressure. We are now adding pulse wave velocity to that. Pulse wave velocity, when your heart beats, that pulse does not immediately make it down to your wrist. There is a delay there. That is an indirect marker of how stiff or how compliant your arteries are. So we have a pulse wave velocity set up over in my office. It's cobbled together from several pieces of equipment. And we have a pulse tonometer that we can put on your radial artery. This is the smoothed version of it. This is the second integral of this or second derivative of this. So we can see when that pressure wave begins. And then we have an ECG. And combining the time difference between the peak of the R here and when this pressure wave hits, along with the distance from your sternal notch down to your radial artery, we can estimate your pulse wave velocity. We began this study uh, the end of last fall semester. We got approval for it, but we, did, we piloted at the end of last fall. We began this study in January. Uh, my undergrad student, Hope Giles, she's the one spearheading this. She presented some preliminary data at University of Mississippi this summer. You can see Dr. Abe sitting here in the front. Um, we are hoping to finish that up ideally by October because we are trying to make some abstract submission deadlines for this study. So this is the one we have going right now. One that we are hoping to get going relatively soon. When we get this new building, we will have a blood lab. We will have a wet lab where we can do blood studies. We'll be right upstairs from the nursing department. So if any of our people are not available to take blood draws, we will have plenty of people downstairs who will be qualified to do that. What I really want to look at, there was an old review paper done in the 90s that hypothesized that intermittent venous occlusion could cause an increase in capillary growth. That by inflating those cuffs, decreasing venous outflow, you would cause that pressure to build back up to the capillary beds. And that this regular intermittent inflation deflation could spur growth of the capillary beds. So I want to see if adding BFR, just the regular lying down BFR, five minutes on, three minutes off, do that five times. We want to measure the VEGF response to that. VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, if it's going to be present, would be present after all of those multiple reperfusions. If we find it acutely that VEGF is present in higher quantities, we would want to take this then to a chronic study, bring people in three times a week, have them run through the inflation protocol, and then measure their vascular conductance using probably what we have is strain gauge plethysmography to measure the increase in volumetric flow through a limb that had its blood flow restricted. If that works, we want to apply this to people who have type 2 diabetes because they are resistant to the effects of VEGF. And if it's uncontrolled, they are more likely to lose capillary beds, specifically in the lower limbs. And that is where we end up with digit amputation and necrosis of tissue. So ultimately, I would like this to be very, very clinically focused. We want to see what happens in a healthy population acutely. And then we want to try a chronic study. And if it works, we want to take it to a more clinical population. So to wrap this up, I did want to make some acknowledgments here. Everything we do, I don't know if you saw some of the author lines on here, but all but two of them end with et al. So, and the rest. In exercise science, all of our studies require a lot of people to come through. It's rarely just one person doing it. I have been very lucky since I have been here to have very, very, very good students. I've had a lot of students help me with research in my labs. A lot of them have gone on to become physical therapists. One just finished her PA school and is now a PA at Georgetown ER in Washington, DC. People that I have been in labs with before 
uh, research is tough, grad school is tough, and we, we bonded a lot over those three years. And then finally, my mentors, Dr. Linicky and Dr. Abe, uh, I lucked out in the lab I got into. I got into that lab when I did, which was before blood flow restriction became popular, and I happened to be in the lab that I was in with the two greatest BFR researchers in the field. So it was a lot of hard work, it was a lot of luck that got me here. But with that, do you all have any questions about blood flow restriction, research? What's going on? I've noticed uh, like athletes training for major events would wear these masks that would restrict air to simulate higher altitudes. Right. Would that be like a positive or a negative effect on BFR? So the, the first issue with that, they're, suppo they're, they're sold as altitude masks. But just wearing the mask, it doesn't decrease the oxygen content in the air. It just makes it more difficult to breathe. Uh, the, the first person that I saw famously do this was an MMA fighter. And you would see him trucking it on the treadmill. And he had taken a garden hose and duct taped it to his mouth. And it caused... It didn't cause like an increase in hematocrit, it didn't cause an increase in red blood cell growth like you would see at altitude. It strengthened his respiratory muscles. His idea behind that was if he is about to get choked out, he needs to get a full, a lung full of air very, very rapidly. And he can do that by strengthening his respiratory muscles. Mostly what we would see if you applied both a, a resistance mask to blood flow restriction is you would never have that person show up ever again. Like it would be so incredibly uncomfortable because not only is the BFR stimulus very uncomfortable the first few times, especially at higher pressures, but now you're also forcing them to struggle to breathe. So I would never recommend combining the two only because both of them by themselves are relatively uncomfortable. I got a couple of questions. Yeah. You may have alluded to this, I may have missed it. Mm -hmm. On the one RM, are you actually measuring one RM or are you calculating? We measure. Yes, measure. we measure. Now, where you might use estimates would be with a clinical population, maybe an older population. I'm always hesitant to say that though, not because of the whole implying older people are weaker, but we did, when I was an undergrad, I managed to get into Dr. Mike's lab. I was helping a PhD student with her study. And we were looking at the difference in muscle hypertrophy, or she was, Lindy Rosso, Dr. Lindy Rosso, was looking at the difference in muscle hypertrophy between young women, between 20 and 30, and older women, between 60 and 70. But they both did the exact same exercise, which was we did circuit training on all of the equipment, mm -hmm. and they did four sets to failure. And we had some 70-year-old women in there doing four sets to failure with no problem, and we directly measured their 1RM. If you were working with a clinical population, probably you'd want to estimate it or take the unaffected limb. But when we do these, we, we directly measure, which is always fun because most of our stuff was upper body. And so we are teaching someone to do a strict back against the wall, perfect form, maximum bicep curl. And you really realize untrained people, sometimes they would get up against the wall and they would start lifting the weight like this. And it was, it was interesting. Uh, but we directly measure it. We, we actually, now that I think about it, we never calculated a 1RM. We directly measured. Trying to use ACSM and SCA standards, no more than five attempts, things like that. Adequate rest between. So you answered one of my questions with the diabetes or, or even taking it further with even having full blown PAD. Right. You know. And do you think there's any implications for people on the other side with venous insufficiency problems? That is Dr. Delp hit me with that question a couple of years ago, and I still don't have an answer for it. I would be I wouldn't be concerned. I would be skeptical if the brief amount of time that they are under restriction would have a true effect on venous insufficiency, on getting those venous walls strengthened a little bit, maybe strengthening that smooth muscle envelope. I would be skeptical, but I would absolutely be willing to test it out. I would even, and this may have no implications whatsoever, because you, you alluded to a moment ago that 
it's really more about the circumference rather than what's, what's right. there. But you think about people who have a gut mm -hmm. for whatever reason, a woman's pregnant or obesity or whatever, right. they're going to have some venous insufficiency. Their mm -hmm. ankles are going to swell right. because there's a barrier here right. in venous return. So I would just be curious if, you know, you looked at a population and maybe did a DEXA scan to see the amount of lean body mass. Right, and, and, the, and the actual limb itself, in, yeah. In, in the abdomen, and then you squat. Okay. And you squatting okay. to, to see if there was a, a difference, you know. Or a diet. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Or then pre-post, you know, I've got a gut today, but mm -hmm. you, know, you do it four months, five months later, and I've lost X amount of weight. How much of a change? Yeah, that, that would be, that would absolutely be something to look at. And entirely possible. We do have PAs now who are specializing in lymphedema. Okay. My mom has the PVD. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that, is, that is the one thing that we absolutely contraindicate with BFR is lymphedema. Well, but she's got the peripheral vascular disease, but she's seeing mm -hmm. this, this PA, uh, PT, I'm sorry, in Montgomery. It's the only thing that's helped her. Yeah. Surgery, none of that stuff. And so I just yeah. feel like some of this. Well, with the BFR in particular, we see a lot of filtration out of the, out of the circulation into the tissue. So if you already have lymphedema, we, we say do not do blood flow restriction at all. Um, I mean, blood flow restriction the way we've talked about it. Now, if you had this sequential inflation, that's how they, that's how they treat it. Right. Uh, but BFR by itself, now that would exacerbate things and you'd have to go in for treatment. Your arm would be huge. Because that swelling, even in someone with a working lymph system, that swelling lasts for about an hour after you finish your exercise. Takes a while for that to filter back into the system. So very different. Yes, yes. Any other questions? Well, again, thank you all very much for showing up. Had a good time. Hope you all learned something. Thank you. Thank you. Trojans Talk Research is a monthly spotlight on the research interests of Choi's faculty, presented by Choi University's Office of Sponsored Programs.